Yeah, so thank you so much once again uh, for this invitation to give the series of lectures. Uh, this is my third lecture. So I'll continue from where I left off last time. And uh, I'm a little behind where I plan to be at this stage in the lectures, but I'll try to catch up and uh, discuss most of the topics that I talked about. Okay, so um, yeah. So what I wanna talk about, so yes, the, in the previous lecture, we had these two questions. Question one was uh, given a pair CW, Uh, where C is some category and W is some subcategory of weak equivalences. So we wanted to describe the category you get by inverting the elements of W. Right, the, the, and the motivation came from looking at weak homotopy equivalences of topological spaces. And the second question was um, given a space Y when does there exist a space X such that Y is equivalent, is homotopy equivalent to the nth loop space of X. Could we fix some n and ask this question? And we answered this question. Uh, we gave one answer, which was this theorem of uh, Stashev in the case n equals one and uh, Peter May in uh, the general case, n bigger than or equal to one, which said that Y is an n for loop space if and only if uh, y is an algebra over this en operator and pi zero of y which gets an induced monoid structure is a group And we also saw that uh, you know, what it meant to give a multiplication, uh, to give the structure of an EN operator meant for every configuration of N disks or these are K little N disks in the unit N disk. we should get a composition law on, on Y, right? So there's a huge set of composition laws parameterized by uh, ways in which you can arrange N disks in the unit disk. And this is where, this is one aspect of higher category theory is the fact that now we have compositions. In particular, there's nothing special about the disk. I could work with a square instead of a disk, a rectangle. And you could think of it this way. For example, if I have two rectangles placed inside the standard unit square, this gives me one composition law on loops two of y, sorry, loops two of x times loops two of x to loops two of x, where I run the first, uh, the first element, if I say gamma one, gamma two, maps to gamma one, gamma two, where gamma one sits in the, in the first space and gamma two sits in the upper space. But I could also compose in the other direction. I could have a picture like this. This gives another composition law. Let's call this composition one. And I have composition two, which is given by this configuration, where I put gamma one here and gamma two here. And this gives me another composition law in loops two of x, this loops two of x, two loops two of x, which is gamma one, gamma two maps to gamma one star two gamma two. Right. So I've given you two composition laws, but there's actually an infinite family for every configuration. And here you start to see that the usual algebra, which we write on a line, we write gamma one star gamma two. Here really they're parameterized, the, the ways of writing compositions for, for uh, are parameterized by a two dimensional object, right? So they live on a two manifold. 
uh, the set of possible configurations are configurations drawn on a two manifold. And so my composition is in some sense governed by a two dimensional type of algebra. And th this is a kind of higher category theory uh, or higher algebra. So I'll come back to this in a second. So, uh, so that's just to recall what we said last time. Now I just want to talk a little bit about a different de-looping machine, the so Siegel's de-looping machine. So this is another uh, way to decide if a space is a loop space. And this will be important when we talk about models for higher categories. So um, the idea is the following that, uh, so first let me talk about the homotopy fiber product. So fiber products in homotopy theory. So in homotopy theory, when we take fiber products, we're not supposed to declare that two things are equal, right? So anytime in classical mathematics that we say two things are equal, we should provide a path or an isomorphism between two things. So let's see how this works out when we try to define fiber products. So if I wanted to take the fiber product X um, over and, and Y over Z, then the usual fiber product, set theoretic fiber product, well, how do you define it or how do you construct it? It's defined by universal property. I'm not going to go into all that. Uh, so this is for those who know what the universal property is, you can think of it as being defined by universal property. And if you're seeing this for the first time, you can take this as a definition, uh, as a definition of a construction, if you like, is this is the set of pairs of triples x comma y, tuples x comma y, such that f of x equals g of y. That's how we define the fiber product. So it's a set of, if, if Y is a point, then you're just looking at the fiber over that point. That's why it's called a fiber product. That's what the, 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 the pullback or the fiber product is, in the case when Y is a point is just the fiber over that given point. Now, how should I change this if I'm doing homotopy theory? I should replace the equality F of X equals G of X by an isomorphism of F of X with G of, with G of Y. Or in other words, a path from f of x to g of y. So the homotopy fiber product of the, of the same diagram is a set of pairs x, y, alpha, where alpha is a path from f of x to g of y. So let's see how this works out for the simplest kind of fiber product that you could think of. So if you take a point mapping to, to Z and a point mapping to Z, well, the ordinary fiber product is just a point again. But if I take the homotopy fiber product, let's call this base point Z, then what is the homotopy fiber product? It's just the loop space of Z based at, Z, at that point. So point, cross over Z point, homotopy fiber product is the loop space. So the loop space is just the simplest kind of fiber product you can construct in homotopy theory. So I'm gonna use this to construct out of any space, a simplicial object. So given a space X, sorry, a base space. We get a simplicial object, topological space, um, which I'll call, um, uh, what should I call this? Um, I guess I'll call this X dot from delta up to topological spaces, to spaces. So now we have different ways of thinking of spaces. You could, if you like, you could say topological spaces. If you prefer simplicial sets, you could put simplicial sets. Um, a space could mean either of these two things. So uh, given such uh, a base space, I get a functor from delta up to spaces defined as follows. So it's um, Xn 
is just a fiber product, the homotopy fiber product over X taken N times. Oops, sorry. Maybe I should call it point. Sorry, I missed out a point. N times, which is nothing but, uh, so X zero is a point. Uh, this is taken uh, oops, N of X. Okay, so, so what this is, is I have a diagram like this point maps to X by the base point, then I have the loop space of X. Um, and then I have the loop space of X times the loop space of X. Oh, sorry, not, this is not loops N of X. I meant loops X to the N. And these maps that I'm drawing are the face maps. So this is D0, D1. This just takes a loop and gives you, so it takes a tuple of loops um, and gives you the, 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 uh, the corresponding endpoints. You continue this way. Okay. So, um, so given any, any uh, topological space, I get the simplicial space, simplicial topological space, whose nth, nth space is just the loop space of X to the N, the homotopy equivalent to the nth space, uh, loop space of X to the N. And it has the following property. So let me make a definition. A functor, X dot from delta of spaces satisfies the Siegel condition if the natural induced map from Xn to the fiber product X1 cross over X naught X1 crossover, which X, oops, there's so many X's here that it gets very confusing, I'm sorry. Uh, the, some of the X's are products and some of the X's are X's. So. Right, so you have a natural map given an N simplex, you have a natural map which picks out the first phase, the second phase and so on. And they agree, if you, if you take, a, for example, X2 mapping to X1 cross over H, X0, X1, what is this map? This map is just taking a two simplex and looking at its zero one phase and its one two phase, which agree along, along, the, along the, their uh, common endpoint, right? So that's why it's a fiber product over X0 because the zero vertex is common to the, the first edge and the second edge. So there's a natural map taken n simplex to a sequence of one simplices, which agree, um, you know, the, the, the tail of the nth one simplex agrees with the, the head of the n minus one n simplex. So that's what this map is. So there's a natural map and you want this map to be an equivalence. So now I can state, so, so we have seen that in particular, for example, the space that I just constructed, X dot starting from a topological space X does satisfy the single condition because it's nth space is just omega X to the N and it's zero at space is just a point and it's first space is just omega X. So this right-hand side would just be omega X cross over a point omega X N times. And that would give me omega X raised to N and the left-hand side is also omega X raised to N. So both sides are equivalent. 
So I just gave, I showed you that the loop space of a topological space gives you such a thing. So, uh, so given x dot delta op to spaces satisfying sequel condition, we get get a, a map as follows. So we have x1 cross x0. I'm going to stop writing the H to indicate homotopy. All products will be homotopy products if I don't indicate otherwise. Okay, so we have X1, okay, maybe let, let me write it for now, but then I'll stop writing it. And then we have X2. And here we have the maps B0, well, which are these maps? Uh, so these are, uh, I'm taking the zero, one, and two. So I'm taking the face opposite two and the face opposite zero. So this is B0 and B, two, and here I have B1, right? And this map is an equivalence by hypothesis, by the Siegel condition. So that means that I get, I can sort of formally, if I formally invert it in the homotopy category of spaces where I've inverted maps, I get a weakly defined map. So I don't actually have a map of topological spaces, but if I could invert weak homotopy equivalences, I would have a map from uh, X1 homotopy fiber product X0, X1 to X1. In particular, if I pass to connected components, I get such a map. In particular, if X0 is a point, let's, let's do the simple case where X0 is a point, is weakly equivalent to point, we get a map from pi0 of x1 cross pi naught of x1 to pi naught of x1. Okay. And uh, one can check using x3 that this, uh, this map is, this makes pi naught into an associative monoid. Associative. Well, all monoids are associative, but I just wanted to specify that associativity is what X3 buys you. So you have this multiplication on pi naught, which makes it into a monoid, which is also associative. Now in the example that I gave you, what was X1? X1 was the loop space and pi naught of X1 is the fundamental group. So this is just the multiplication on the fundamental group. And that multiplication is associative because of X3, right? So X3, remember it was what happens when you compose three things, you have three loops now, and that's where you have a homotopy from the three different ways of the, sorry, the two different ways of bracketing three things. Uh, so that's why X3 is responsible for the associativity, right? So, uh, so I, I leave it as an exercise to, to check, uh, maybe I should say exercise to check this. Just need to use X3 to write some diagrams to check that this is true. Okay, so, uh, so at the level of pi naught it's associative. And now here's the theorem. that a space Y, Y is an, is a loop space. Y is, is equivalent to a loop space. So, oh, sorry, I should say this is due to Siegel. Y is equivalent to a loop space if and only if there exists a simplicial object x dot top to spaces such that x1 is equivalent to y and, oh, sorry, I should, yeah, x dot is a Siegel object and pi naught of x dot, sorry, pi naught of x1 is a group under the induced monoid structure. Okay, so 
I gave you one way to detect uh, a loop spaces that was due to Stashev and me, which had the flavor of, uh, which had an operatic flavor where you sort of explicitly specify operations of multiplication on loops. And in fact, you encode all possible operations. And uh, when, yeah, and from there you, you, you get a de-looping machine. And, and here's another de-looping machine due to Siegel, which has more the flavor of, uh, you know, simplicial objects, which I talked about when I defined quasi categories. Um, which has, yeah, so there's a different flavor. And the idea is that, you know, there are many different de-looping machines. And each time you have a de-looping machine, you get from it a model for infinity categories. So I'm gonna discuss those in a second. So uh, I'm gonna now sort of change tack a little bit and go to question one, but I just wanted to mention, this is a follow-up to question two, where we talked about de-looping, uh, finding out whether a space is a loop space. And uh, this is yet another answer to that question. And that's gonna reappear again a little later. Let's move on. So now I want to talk about um, question one. So maybe let, let me make a definition. Okay, let's say uh, back to question one. So uh, let, me, let me just give a name to these things. A pair. CW, where C is a category, and W is a subcategory. I'll call this uh, is a homotopy theory. So the examples we want to keep in mind are things like you could take C equal to any category and W equal to isomorphisms. In this case, the problem I described of inverting isomorphisms is pretty boring. There's nothing to do, you're already invertible. I could take C any category and W equal to C. In this case, the problem is to invert all morphisms. So I want to make every morphism in this category into an isomorphism. It's a very brutal thing to do, but it might be interesting in some situations. For example, you might take a monoid, which is a category with one object, and ask what happens if you invert all the elements in this monoid. But now let's go to some more interesting example. You could take C equal to spaces, let's say C equal to top, top star maybe, and W equal to F, so weak homotopy for instance. You could take C equal to uh, chain complexes. So uh, I, I maybe I should just recall what a weak home difference is. This is the set uh, F from X to Y such that by N, by N X, X, such that the induced map, it's a map such that the induced maps on homotopy groups are isomorphisms for all N. Uh, then you can have C equal to chain complexes of R modules. Where R is some ring. So you take R modules and look at chain complexes of them and W equal to quasi isomorphisms. So or maybe I should just recall a chain complex looks like a sequence of R modules, VI, VI plus one, VI minus one, and so on, with maps between them. DI, DI minus one, and so on, such that DI minus one composed with DI is equal to three. Um, and you, you take W equal to quasi isomorphisms. Which are the maps F from V to W such that the nth homology map HN of F mapping HN of V to HN of W is an iso for all N. 
and Hn is defined to be the kernel of D divided by the energy. Okay, so this is another example. Could take chain complex of R modules, or more generally, we could take C equal to chain complexes in A, where A is some chain complexes. So C is chain complexes of objects in any abelian category. So A might be, for example, coherent sheaves on some space, on some scheme. Or a complex manifold. Uh, that's a typical example uh, I have in mind. So, so uh, anytime you have an abelian category like R modules or coherent sheaves, you have this uh, notion of quasi isomorphism, and you'd like to invert quasi isomorphisms for the same reason that you'd like to invert weak homotopy frequencies between topological spaces, because in some sense you only care about the homology. You, I mean, well, you don't only care about the homology, but you you care about the homology of the chain complex. And uh, you think of different chain complexes, different ways to represent a shape having the same homology. It's an algebraic incarnation of a shape um, having a given, um, you know, homotopy type, if you like. So, so let's get on to how to invert these uh, these maps. So let's formulate what the problem even means. So maybe let me call it a definition. So if it exists, so, so given C and W, C W inverse is a category So I'm saying if it exists, but it always does, but I'm just, you know, it always does modulo set theoretic issues that I want to ignore and not discuss at the moment. So CW inverse, uh, if it exists, is, is a category with the following universal property. That, uh, you have a map from C to C W inverse. And if you have a, a functor to any other category D, uh, let's call this F and let's call this uh, pi. So, so for all F uh, a functor such that F of W is an isomorphism for all W in arrows of W, there exists unique H, uh, or well, I guess G. That makes this diagram for me, right? So, so this is what CW inverse is if it exists. And how can you construct it? You can construct it. So this is very similar to how you, you define localization of commutative rings. You want to invert some set of elements and it's defined by universal property. And if it exists, well, there's only one thing you can do, which is uh, so, so modulo set theoretic issues, which are not very serious. Uh, CW ex W inverse exists. It's called the Gabriel Zisman localization. And its objects are the so how is it how can you describe it? Its objects are the same as the objects of C. And HOM from X to Y, it's the only thing you can think of doing, which is well, you're supposed to uh, invert elements of W. So you start with X and you have maps that go backwards. Oh, maybe I should write this. A new page. So, so the objects are the same as the objects of C, and the morphisms you allowed backward morphisms as well as forward morphisms, and the backward morphisms have to be the ones that are invertible because you're you 
you're allowed to put them backwards because they're inverses of something that you know is, is pointing forward. So uh, so you have x um, x one this. All the way up to x, sorry, up to y, which is x, the last one. Oops, sorry, this color is very confused. So you go all the way up to y, and you have the backward arrows are all in are in the in the in w, so w one, w two, and so on. So you write a zigzag like this. I hope it's clear. Modulo a relation, and the relation is that if two successive arrows are inverses of each other, for example, then you can cancel them out to just replace them by a single identity. And then you might find when you've done this that you have successive arrows that you can compose, and you're allowed to compose, and so on. So, so the natural relations that you can impose is, uh, is this equivalence relation. So zigzag paths, modulo, relations. So I'm not going to write out in interest of time, I'm going to write out the whole thing. It's, it's what you think it is. But now it turns out that uh, when we impose the relation, so we have the zigzag paths, and we impose the relations that come from canceling out, um, you know, so if I have f, so for example, f, uh, maybe I should write one relation. Um, Actually, I, 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 if anybody wants to ask me, feel free to ask me. I think I don't want to write out the full details because it may just take time and then I won't get to uh, the more interesting stuff. So, so I hope it's clear from the description what you're supposed to do. And uh, so you have these zigzag paths and you identify certain zigzag paths. Uh, for example, you would identify, let me write the simplest possible one. If you have uh, X and you have W and W uh, from Y, so from some z to x, this is equivalent to x, x identity, which is equal to identity, identity x in CWNS. Okay. So you're allowed to cancel out morphisms, for example. And the backward arrows are all in W. Um, so, but we have committed a cardinal sin here by, by identifying two things without explaining how we identified them. So when we impose the equivalence relation, we're taking one zigzag path and identifying it with another zigzag path uh, by declaring them to become equal in the quotient, right? But instead it would be better if I remember the ways in which I could cancel out arrows and compose arrows to go from one zigzag path to an equivalent zigzag path. And, and that leads to the notion of simplicial localization. So, so given, so maybe this is a definition if you like, definition. Hello. Yes. This is something. Of course, yeah. Please go ahead. Feel free to ask it any time. Okay. So, uh, having a homomorphism between x and y, where x and y is it, uh, the localization of W, uh, mm -hmm. is actually having a, a sequence of spaces x one, x two. Is like yeah. Okay. Hello, I couldn't hear the last part of your. Could you okay. repeat? Yes, so ha having uh, a morphism between X and Y, uh, mm -hmm. considering a sequence of uh, spaces X1, X2, something like that? Absolutely, exactly, yes. Okay, uh, and how these X1, X2 are related to X and Y? Oh, that's a good question, they're not related at all. So there's uh, a morphism from X to Y in the localization, 
is the choice of any other sequence of objects in the category and backward arrows you know and zigzags as i've shown so in between you have some other objects i don't know z1 z2 z okay z1 z2 but there will be these will be there and x1 x2 and x1 x2 and so on so it's it's a, it's a choice of this data of of all these objects in between and these arrows between them. okay and these uh, w's are uh, the inverses that we could find yeah w's are any arrows in w you uh, sorry in capital w you are allowed to draw a backward arrow because, because in the in, in the localization the arrows in w are invertible right so if i write w1 pointing backwards it has an inverse i mean in the localized category it should morally have an inverse that oh, inverse is you're thinking of it as pointing forwards oh, okay. okay thank you is it clear yes yes but so so that it just comes from thinking suppose i had a category where elements arrows and w are invertible then what would i be able to do i would have let's take an arrow w1 which belongs to the category capital w let's call it inverse v1 then i can form the composite f1 composed with v1 right i mean that's going from uh i can do first v1 which would go from x1 to z1 and then i could do f1 which would go from z1 to x1 then if v2 is the inverse of w2 i could do v2 which goes from x1 to z2 and then i could do f2 which goes from z2 to x2 and i could compose all these to get a morphism from x to y but the problem is i don't really have an inverse called v1 it doesn't yet exist in in c it it's something i want to add in by hand right so how do i add it in i simply declare that it exists and so when i write w1 pointing backwards i'm thinking of it as v1 point, pointing forwards but i'm not allowed to write v1 because there is no such thing called you know there is no arrow called v1 in the category c so the arrow called v1 will be the thing that i get by taking w1 pointing backwards so if i want to know what the inverse of w is i would simply take w pointing backwards to z1 and i would take the identity map to z1 this is an inverse to w1 because i i didn't tell you how to compose maps maybe i should tell you that so composition is defined as follows if you have x w y let me just show you how it works for a single for a single zigzag okay, so x f and i have y prime if i have u and v then i simply form i form the fiber product here u cross z y and uh, and then look at this arrow i mean look at the outer part of the of the circle well this would only work if i had some properties of w but in general i could just concatenate so yeah um, for a general pair cw you just concatenate two zigzags that gives you another zigzag that's the that's the composition if w has some nice properties you can you can use this okay so ignore what i just said that was a little uh, out of so i should just say composition is concatenation yeah uh, sorry yeah. so the composition which you just said that works for abelian categories so is that the main reason you define like this zigzag instead of just composing two arrows like f so, by g sorry i didn't understand the question yeah so so like now you mentioned like suppose you have a morphism from x to x1 x1 to x2 then you can compose as a morphism from x to x1 like in the same spirit of this localization maps like let us take some yeah so what i was just saying at the end this remark which i shouldn't have made uh, was that there are situations in which 
uh, single zigzag suffices. So you don't have to do up and down zigzags, yeah. but you can that, just that, take a single zigzag. And, yeah. and that, that is, works. I think you, you were saying that that would work for chain complexes in an abelian category. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, I, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So, and particularly this zigzag works for like the other cases, like. This zigzag is just a general, very general, general. Thing. It always works. Okay. No hypothesis, right? I mean, uh, the only hypothesis are set theoretic. And the set theoretic constraint is basically related to the other, other question I had uh, was asked before this, that I have to choose all these objects, Z1, Z2 in between. And if the category is large, then there's a very large set of such paths. Mm -hmm. So you have to, you know, you have to do this usual stuff about, is it a set or is it a class or, you know. So if you want your category to be locally small, which means that the Homs form sets, mm -hmm. then you might run into trouble because the Homs, if the category is large, if you start with a large category, which means the objects form a large set uh, or a class, if you like, um, e even if the harms in the original category are sets, when you form the localization, you have to consider all possible objects in your paths. So you would get a large set of paths between two objects. And, and that's the set theoretic issue, basically. Okay, okay, thanks. But it's, it's, it's some, you know, these set theoretic issues, uh, they, they are very rarely important and they're basically important when you talk about things like the adjoint complex theorem. Um, okay. So I want to sort of ignore them because they can be fixed. I mean, you can use the right jargon and put the right hypotheses about universes and classes and get like that. Okay, so, so the dwyer kahn simplicial localization is the following. Given CW, you ask the same universal property. Can I ask one? Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, uh, in this form set, uh, we get uh, X1 and Z1, all these uh, objects. Yeah. These, uh, these objects uh, come from W or come from objects of C? Uh, they come from C. They can be any objects of C. Okay, and, but then W1 is a morphism in W, right? Right. Okay, so X and Z1 should be in the object of W. So if you, uh, yes, so automatically they will be objects of W, but the, the point is that if you look at the examples, right? So you should really think of W as a class of morphisms. Uh, of course they have sources and targets, uh, but let me go back to the examples. So in all the examples, the w objects of the, the, the ob objects of C, is it something? Sorry? In W, objects of W are all objects of C? Yeah, in most real life examples, all objects of W, I mean, so the objects of W are all objects of C. Okay. You, um, yeah, but in general, yeah, you're right. So, I mean, if if I had a situation where I was some for some reason discarding some objects of C and passing to a smaller set of objects in W, uh, then yes, then the intermediate objects would have to be in W because the and arrows are in W, so they're so, so, so. Also in W, right? Would have to be in W, yeah. But in all, essentially all examples that you ever consider, the reason you consider this is because you want to invert a class of morphisms. And typically those morphisms are defined. Uh, actually they always will be because it, usually you, you take W to be something that contains isomorphism. So I didn't say that here. Uh, I guess you could do it even if you don't, but typically you consider W to be a class, uh, you know, a subcategory which contains all isomorphisms. So in particular, it will contain all identity maps. And therefore, the objects of W will equal to objects of C in all, oh. you know, if you put that hypothesis. I didn't write that hypothesis because it's not essential for what I'm saying, but you might as well add it. I mean, it's... So when we are trying to do this localization, it's, uh, mm -hmm. I'm taking a particular type of morphisms in C and then trying to see their inverse. Exactly. You should think of it as saying that I have some morphisms, which are, you know, think of the examples like weak homotopy equivalences, mm -hmm. which tell you when you want to regard two things as being the same. You want to regard two, if you're a topologist, you want to think of two, I mean, if you're a homotopy theorist or an algebraic topology person, you want to think of two shapes as being the same if they are weakly homotopy equivalent. Mm -hmm. So you would like to say that a weak homotopy equivalence is an isomorphism. But you don't know in which world it's an isomorphism. You want to create a world, a category, in which these maps become isomorphisms. That's the motivation, right? That's what you're trying to do. 
So you might want to do that with weak homotopy equivalences. You might want to do that with quasi isomorphisms. But any time in, ma in mathematics that you have two structures, I mean, you have a structure that contains more information than what you want. For example, a point set topological space contains way too much information. That's what I started my lectures with, right? That it, it doesn't really encode what you think of when you do homotopy theory. So how do you get rid of that extra information? You want to declare certain maps between them to become, you know, to be isomorphic. So that's what we're doing. We're forcing those maps to become isomorphic. So we're formally inverting them. Thanks. Yeah. So, so that's the motivation. And so that's why in all examples, uh, the all isomorphisms and identity maps will be in W. So you might as well add that as a hypothesis if you like. And in that case, all objects of C will be objects of W. So, okay, so, so given C and W, uh, the simplicial localization, Of, uh, of CW, which is a homotopy, I also called it a homotopy theory, uh, is a simplicially enriched category. So is a category enriched in simplicial sets. In simplicial sets, I'll call it L, WC with the following universal property. So the universal property, let me open a new page so I have some space here. So the universal property is the following that you have a map from C to L WC. It's what you think. So and a map, a given any map to D that exists unique. And let me say what, the, what D and this, these maps are. Um, so, well, by the way, I should say that the map from C to LW of C is part of the data. This is before, uh, is a, it's a category uh, with the following universal property. I, pi was part of the data, right? So it's really a category equipped with a map from C that has the universal property. So similarly here is a simplicially enriched category uh, equipped with a, with a functor from C with the following universal property uh, that um, for any, for all F from C, well, for all simplicially enriched categories D, I'll say what this is in a moment, but it's simplicially enriched categories. Uh, and for all F C to D, such that uh, F of W is invertible up to homotopy. Um, there exists unique G. Okay, so let me say uh, in words, what is a simplicially enriched category? It's a category, in, it's something like a category, but except that the HOM sets are not sets, they are simplicial sets. So the HOMs are spaces. So definition, uh, an S set enriched category, is given by, is specified by a set of objects say D, a set of D of objects and for all X, Y in objects of D, a simplicial set Um, say maps x, y, and composition 
maps x y cross maps y z to maps x z, and this is a morphism of simplicial sets. Of course, there's nothing special about simplicial sets. Anytime you have a, a category where you have a notion of tensor product, where you can tensor two objects together, you can define what an enriched category is. All I'm doing is instead of having a set of forms, I'm having a, a space of forms. In other words, the set of forms itself, the forms themselves form an object of another category. In this case, the forms form a space. So they form the object, an object in the category of simplicial sets or topological spaces, if you like. And um, you could do vector space enriched categories where the homes form a vector space. If you look at the category of vector spaces itself, that's a vector space enriched category because the homes in the category of vector spaces can be organized into vector spaces themselves. So, um, so that's what it is. You could talk about a top enriched category where this map XY is not a simplicial set, but a topological space and so on. So, uh, so you want the composition, which, uh, and then you want units, one X, which belongs to, is a zero simplex in map XX, right? So it's a point in map XX, which you can think of as a zero simplex, uh, satisfying associativity and unit axioms. The, that the composition is associated and so on. So this is what a simplicially enriched category is. And given, so maybe let me give a one a definition here. A one possible definition of, I give you one definition of an infinity category before, uh, or maybe not, it's not called a definition, let's say remark. Uh, so earlier I said that, was, that weak con complexes are a model for infinity categories. Uh, it turns out this is another model for infinity categories. So another way to model the same idea, a, an S set enriched category or, or rather S set enriched categories are a model for infinity one, infinity category. Okay. So what do I mean by this? Well, if I take one of these S set enriched categories, they have objects but they have a space of morphisms between them. And we, we saw earlier that you can think of a simplicial set as a, uh, as, you know, as being a space as being, as defining an infinity groupoid, something that has objects, paths between objects, homotopies between paths, and paths between homotopies and so on and so on and so on. So the maps in this category themselves form such a structure. So this category is an infinity category because it has objects, one morphisms, which are the paths, uh, sorry, one morphisms which are the points in maps x y, two morphisms which are the paths in maps x y, three morphisms which are the homotopies in a, in maps x y, and so on and so on and so on. And there's a composition uh, defined on all these all these structures, right? So, what this construction of simplicial localization, if it exists, uh, is is it's producing from a homotopy theory, which is a, a pair consisting of a category and a subcategory of weak equivalences. It, its output will be an infinity category. So what I'm saying is that anytime you have a category, ordinary category from, you know, uh, like topological spaces, vector spaces, whatever, and you have a notion of weak equivalence, which is a notion of uh, any subcategory, uh, which contains all objects, if you like, you can produce from it an infinity one category by this process of simplicial localization. Okay. So it's a theorem of Dwyer and Kahn, that simplicial localizations exist. I mean, let me just say always, always modulo some set theoretical issues or whatever, like before, always exist. So it's reasonable to say always, I mean, it's, it's essentially always. Um, so you can always construct this guy. And 
So you might wonder, you know, why should this exist? I'm just telling you some facts that this thing is supposed to exist. But let me tell you, it, it really comes, uh, you know, where it comes from. So it comes from uh, taking those zigzags. And so the zigzags will form the vertices in maps X, Y. Then what are the paths between zigzags? What are the one simplices? Anytime you have a relation, you can think of it as, as, uh, as a path between uh, two, two of these zigzags. And anytime you have two, you compose two such relations, you get a, a triangle. So you get a two simplex in maps X, Y. So there's one such model. So, uh, so let me say a remark that there are several models. There are several models for LWC. What do I mean by models? I mean that the simplicial set of homes that maps X, Y is only supposed to be defined up to weak homotopy terms. Right? So uh, you may have one construction and I may have a completely different construction of this week of LWC, um, which, uh, which are equivalent. So th that means that you have, if that happens, I would say that I have a different model from you. So I'm gonna describe one model to you, but before that, let me just make one, uh, one more remark um, or observation, I, I guess, that if, D is a simplicial category, is an S set enriched category. We get an ordinary category by zero of D, which is defined as follows. The objects of pi zero of D are the objects of D and harm in pi zero of D from X to Y is pi zero of the mapping space from X to Y. The connected components of the simplicial set of maps, if you like, uh, that's the same thing as pi zero of the geometric realization of maps X, Y. So maps X, Y was a simplicial set. I can think of it as a space. If you want to convert it to point set topology, you can take the geometric realization uh, or you can just directly work with the simplicial set. In either case, you can define connected components which is path components of the space. And if it passed to pi naught, then you will get an ordinary category. Okay. So uh, if LWC exists, which I said it does, then by the universal property, pi zero of LWC is C W N S. That's automatic because if you go back to the definition, what is the definition? The definition is that if I look at any functor that takes every element of W to something that is invertible up to homotopy, but what does invertible up to homotopy mean? It means exactly that it's invertible in pi zero of D. Okay, so the definition of invertible up to homotopy is invertible in pi zero of d. And what does invertible in pi zero of d mean? It means that given f of w, you can find some other morphism uh, v such that f of w times v composed with v can be connected by a path to the identity morphism. And similarly, v composed with f of w can be connected by a path to the identity morphism. That's what it means. That's the same thing as saying that when I pass to connected components of the mapping spaces, f of v, comp you know, the, the class of f of v composed with the class of v is equal to the identity morphism in pi zero of d. Okay, so is this definition clear? I think this is a really important construction because this is one machine to construct a huge family of infinity categories. So by, by the universal property, we see immediately that pi zero of the simplicial localization is CW inverse. So let me describe one model, uh, which is called the hammock localization. I won't describe it in much detail, but I'm just going to give you the idea of why this thing even exists. Uh, how do you construct it? 
So the morphisms, I just have to tell you what the morphism space is. So what are the morphisms? Basically, you look at zigzags again. Okay. But if I have two zigzags, maybe if you can draw. I could take another zigzag here. Now I could look at arrows that make these squares commute. Right? This would be a one simplex. So the zero simplices are zigzags. I'm describing maps x, y. The zero simplices are just the usual zigzags. What, what are the one simplices? The one simplices will be things that make the diagrams like this commute, okay, between two zigzags. So one simplices connect to zero simplices. And I could talk about two simplices. Two simplices would be things involving another level. So, and remember in the zigzags, the backward arrows are always, uh, and sorry, there are dots here. There should be dots. This extends and so on. Uh, one simplices are commutative diagrams like that and, and so on. And here, if I have uh, K, K plus one rows, this gives me a K simplex in map x1. Okay. Where the, the rows are also, uh, so there are green arrows connecting successive rows. So what it is. Okay. So these hammocks, so they look like hammocks, right? Because uh, you can see if I draw k such rows, you get a picture like a hammock. That's why it's called a hammock localization. And basically the vertical arrows are implementing the fact, the equivalence relation that we had earlier. But now I'm remembering how I'm identifying two zigzags, not just identifying them blindly. So, uh, or you know, just not just sort of collapsing all possible ways of identifying. So, so that's the idea. So that's why it exists. Uh, morally, at least you can see why, how you would go about constructing. Uh, you would draw these hammocks and these would be case indices. So, so, okay, so, so let's move on to what are examples of infinity categories. Can you display the previous page slightly? Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So this mod, so the number of nodes uh, in the zigzag is uh, not a well-defined thing. So by yeah by the morphism between two zigzags, what exactly you uh, meant? I I mean like look at diagrams of this type. Okay. These are the case indices. And what are the face maps? The face maps are, you can, uh, for example, if I had just two rows, mm -hmm. the face map would be, uh, the zeroth face map would be take the top row, the first face map would be take the bottom row. Okay. If I have three simplices, I mean, sorry, if I have three rows, that corresponds to two simplex, I could take, now I have three faces I can take. I can take just the top two rows, that's one face. I could take the bottom two rows, that's another face. Or I could compose the vertical arrows, the green arrows, mm -hmm. and get two rows again. Mm -hmm. But I've deleted the middle row now. I've just composed the vertical arrows. That would be the third phase. Okay. So this whole structure gets organized into a into a simplicial object. Okay. So in principle, there may be like no arrows from uh, like no maps from between two nodes. Those things can also happen. Really. So uh, suppose uh, suppose x two y like the uh, one zigzag consists of say x one x two another zigzag consists of say x one x two x x one prime x two prime x three prime. Uh -huh. so, so in that case, like yeah, then they would be in different connected components. So they would not. Uh, so they would be in different connected components of maps from x to y. 
Okay. So they, they may be no one simplex connecting them, which is a good thing because we don't want maps from X to Y to be, you know, in general maps from X to Y should have some connected component. Okay. okay. When I take pi naught of it, I get this kind of the homotopy, this thing is also called the homotopy category, the CW inverse. Mm -hmm. So I start with the pair CW, which is my homotopy theory, like topological spaces and weak homotopy. Theory. When I invert W, I get homotopy types, spaces up to homotopy films. That's CW inverse. Mm -hmm. And I the set of maps between two homotopy types in, in CW inverse, we don't want it to be, in general, we don't expect it to be just have you know, one element. It will have many elements. Those elements are the connected components of the maps in the simplicial localization. So maps from X to Y in general has many connected components. And what you just said is absolutely right, which is that if I have two zigzags, there's absolutely a priori no reason why there's a one simplex or a sequence of one simplex simplices connecting them, mm -hmm. which is a good thing because that means that they're not in the same path component. Right? There are many path components okay. in map X, Y. Yeah, but that's absolutely right. Yeah, thanks, thanks. for the comment. Yeah, and I'm not given the full details here of the construction. I'm just sort of trying to say how it's supposed to work, right? I mean, there's, you have to write out various details and I have to explain the equivalence relation and so on. So it's, uh, but I think it's, I've, I've said enough that if you thought really hard about it, you could kind of from first principles now discover this construction uh, and the details. I hope so, at least. If not, I kind of, I, I didn't succeed in what I was trying. Um, but anyway, so we can now forget the construction because we, we need only the universal. So all these constructions are, are characterized by universal properties. So it doesn't matter how you construct it. Is once you know it exists, it's uniquely determined by its universal property, determined up to equivalence. Um, so maybe I should just say one more thing, uh, make a definition here. Uh, so when do you say two infinity categories in this sense are equivalent? So definition. A Dwyer Khan equivalence. So let C and D, C, D, B, S set and rich categories a Dwyer Khan equivalence. Uh, F from C to D. Sorry, I was using small f's. Stick to that. Uh, is a simple asset and rich functor that just means that I have a map on objects. And for every pair of objects, I have a map of simplicial sets from map X, XY to map F of X, F of Y. It's what you expect, which is compatible with the multiple composition. Uh, is an asset and rich functor such that two things hold. One, pi zero C mapping to pi zero D oops, sorry, by pi zero F is an equivalence of categories of ordinary categories. And two, uh, F X Y mapping maps in C X Y to maps in D of fx, fy is a weak homotopy equivalence of simplicial sets. So the collection of infinity categories or S set and rich categories. So let's, let, let's, uh, let's say cat S set by definition, the category of S set and rich categories. And W Dwyer Khan by definition equal to Dwyer Khan equivalences So then cat has said comma W DK is itself a homotopy theory by my earlier definition. And the localization LWDK of cat set 
is therefore uh, itself an S set and its category is a model for the infinity category of infinity categories. So what do infinity categories form? They naturally themselves form an infinite, an infinity category. And when I was earlier saying that, uh, I earlier described weak con complexes as a model for infinity categories. Then I described a infinity categories and said, that's a model for infinity categories. What did I really mean by that sentence? What I meant is that all of these can be organized into homotopy theories. There's a homotopy theory of weak con complexes. There's a homotopy theory of uh, simplicially enriched categories. There's homotopy theory of A infinity categories. And all of them, their simplicial localizations are equivalent. So the infinity category of simplicially enriched categories is equivalent to the infinity category of weak con complexes, also known as quasi categories, uh, is equivalent to the infinity category of A infinity categories, and so on. So to even formulate what it means that all these different things model the same thing, you need to formulate the idea of a homotopy theory of homotopy theory. So, so, uh, so that's what I was talking about, models for infinity categories. Uh, so I've, I'll, I'll say that two homotopy theories are equivalent if their simplicial localizations are, are equivalent, definition. Uh, Uh, homotopy theories CW, C prime, W prime are equivalent homotopy theories if LWC is equivalent, is Dwyer Kahn equivalent. Well, maybe I should write better. Uh, is uh, is isomorphic to L W prime C prime in phi naught of L Dwyer Kahn of cat S set. Okay. So all of these things that I described can be organized into homotopy theories. So for example, uh, there's the homotopy theory. So Uh, well, so, uh, well, I didn't define uh, when two weak con complexes are equivalent. There's a construction that takes weak con complexes to simplicially enriched categories, and you declare two weak con complexes to be equivalent if their corresponding dual con, uh, so their corresponding simplicial categories are dual con equivalent. So, um, so let me just say, just give, just write it as an example. So you say that quasi categories aka weak con complexes and let's say joy, some class of equivalences called joyal equivalences. Um, then, then we have this cat as set and W Dwyer Khan. Uh, then I'm going to describe some other models. So let me say uh, infinity categories and W Dwyer Khan. So A infinity categories would be basically like uh, simplicially enriched categories, except that the composition from maps X, Y, uh, to maps, cross maps Y, Z, to maps X, Z is not strictly associative. Uh, in fact, you have an infinite tower for each uh, n. We have uh, and sorry, and uh, oh, sorry. We, we have maps uh, 
from E1 of n, the little disk operad of n with n intervals cross maps from E, so how many do I want here? So I want zero, one, two. So, okay, so E n minus one, E n, sorry, X n minus one, X n. X n minus one, X n cross dot dot. X n minus two, X n minus one cross all the way up to maps x0, x1, to maps x1, x0, xn, right? So an infinity category would be something like, just as we replaced strictly associ uh, associative algebras by A infinity algebras, an infinity category would be something where these compositions, you have spaces of maps between two objects, which could be thought of as simplicial sets or as topological spaces, and you have um, a sequence of multiplications for higher and higher n, which give you, uh, you know, for every point in E1 of n, you have a multiplication law and they satisfy whatever compatibility conditions come from the operatic structure in E1 of n. It's the obvious things that you would think of, uh, but again, I don't want to write down the full details. And the weak equivalences are again, dwyer kahn equivalences. They're maps that induce functors between these categories, which uh, on the mapping spaces induce um, uh, weak homotopy equivalences. So all of these three things would be models for, for the homotopy theory of infinity categories. In the sense that if I invert the weak equivalences, I would get the same simplicially enriched category or, or same in the sense that the answers would be dwyer kahn equivalent. So let me describe a Siegel style definition. Finally, let me just end with a Siegel style So, 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 sorry, I said examples of, these are models of infinity categories. So now I want to give some Siegel style models of infinity categories. So these are, uh, so the idea is to use the Siegel delooping machine. So for the infinity category definition, I used um, the, the, st the stash of D-looping machine. So here we want to use the Siegel D-looping machine. So, so let me just uh, first state a principle. So this is called the uh, growth index. homotopy hypothesis. It states the following thing that for any, for any reasonable model, for any good model of infinity groupoids, whatever infinity groupoid, infinity categories are, we know that they should have objects, one morphisms, two morphisms between them, three morphisms between those and so on, and some laws of composition. And it's extremely hard to make precise what this means. And I, I described two ways to do it, but that required you know, people to come up with ingenious ways of thinking about things. And uh, so it's not very easy to define what an infinity category is as we have seen. But, uh, but we have also seen that there are many different ways to, to define what an infinity category is. And so, so you know, how are we gonna root our constructions? How are we gonna decide that you know, this is a correct definition of an infinity category? So we need some grounding principle. And the growth index idea was that whatever a model you have for infinity groupoids, it should have the following property, that there should exist an equivalence of homotopy theories from topological spaces To infinity groupoids in this model, which models the idea of taking the fundamental infinity groupoid. So, for example, a realization of the principle which we saw in the first lecture 
was the following. So, so model infinity groupoids, we saw that Khan complexes were a good model intuitively for infinity groupoids because given a Khan complex, there was a well-defined notion of objects, which were the vertices, the one morphisms were the simplices and a composition was defined by looking at sim uh, two-dimensional simplices and associativity came from looking at three-dimensional simplices and so on. And so we saw that Khan complexes are a good model for infinity groupoids. So you can ask, well, does it satisfy growth index homotopy hypothesis? And it does because we constructed this functor uh, top to simplicial sets called Sing, which had this adjoint. And Sing realizes a homo an equivalence of homotopy theories, gives an equivalence of homotopy theories top and with weak homotopy equivalences of top. And unfortunately, the other side will also be called weak homotopy equivalences. A set. Right. So you can define homotopy groups for a simplicial set combinatorially. Uh, one way to define it by sort of cheating, but it's it's a it's a good definition is to simply take the geometricalization of the simplicial set and take the homotopy groups of that. That's a valid definition. But you can, it turns out you can also give a purely combinatorial definition using just uh, the structure of the category delta. And, and the point is that this functor sing, in fact, implements this, uh, implements an equivalence of homotopy theories, meaning that if I localize top, that's equivalent to localizing simplicial sets. It's not an equivalence of categories. Simplicial sets is not the same as point set. The study of simplicial sets is not literally the same as the study of point set topology. If you don't invert weak homotopy inferences, but when you do, it's equivalent. Okay. So, so this realizes growth index principle in this particular model. But I could take some other model for infinity groupoids and ask, is this theorem true? And it, this is a testing ground is to check if your model makes sense, if it's a good model, is to check whether the notion of infinity groupoids in this uh, in this theory coincides with the notion of topological spaces up to weak homotopy points. So, but this is a starting point. So the heuristic idea. Is that an infinity infinity one category, aka infinity category? Well, what should it be? It should be something in which not every morphism has to be invertible, right? Uh, but I'm going to make it uh, when I say infinity one category, that means every morphism above level one should be invertible. That's a definition. So an infinity one category is a higher category in which every morphism above level one is invertible. But that is the same thing as that's just the same thing as saying that the, the set of maps between two objects forms an infinity group. Right? So in which so an infinity one category is a higher category in which every k morphism is invertible for K strictly bigger than one, which is equivalent. So, so I can define this for any N in fact. So infinity N category is uh, a high category in which every K morphism is invertible for every K or all K bigger than, bigger than N. So in particular, an infinity one category. So, so this principle implies that an infinity one category is a category weakly enriched in infinity groupoids, right? And that's why I define an S set and this category to be an infinity one category because the homes are infinity groupoids. Homes are spaces, but I could have said con complexes. I could have said it should be enriched in con complexes, but uh, it turns out that every 
every Khan complex is weakly equivalent, every, sorry, every simplicial set is weakly equivalent to a Khan complex. So, so um, I don't lose too much by allowing more general simplicial sets. Um, okay, so, the, so, so intuitively infinity one category is something weakly enriched in infinity group as and weakly enriched means that the composition doesn't have to be strictly associative. It, it, it's associative up to higher homotopies. So one possibility is to require strict associativity, but then I need to know that anything that has weak associativity can be made strict. And that turns out to be true for infinity one categories, but not for infinity two categories and higher. So it's something very special to infinity one categories that I could give you this very simple definition where I take S set enriched categories, which are strictly enriched and composition is strictly associative. And that also gives me a model for infinity categories. That's something really very special to N equals one. Okay. Um, so, okay. So let me close with this Siegel style definition. Infinity one categories. Aka infinity categories. So there are there are two. So let me give you one, which is Siegel categories. The definition. Um, a simplicial simplicial set. Uh, or a simplicial topological space. Let me just say simplicial space, uh, x dot from delta op to spaces is a Siegel category if xn to xn homotopy fabric product x naught x1. Oops, sorry. I always have a problem here. Also, x one. There's too many x's. I should really have chosen a different symbol here, like a y or something. Okay, I think this works. So this is n times. The Siegel maps uh, are weak equivalences. So how can you interpret this as a category? I'll just finish with this. So, so this gives rise to so the objects of C. So objects of X dot is by definition X naught. The arrows of this category, the one morphisms is X one and composition is given as in the Siegel delooping machine. So X two maps to X one homotopy fiber product, X naught X one maps to X one, and this is a weakly defined map. So this is an equivalence. This is D zero D two, and this is D one, and this is your weakly you no know, sort of weakly defined composition. And uh, phi zero of this category. So. Uh, let me say a simple is a Siegel category. Uh, let's call the Siegel category something X, script X, then pi zero of X dot of X is, um, is given by so the objects of pi zero of X is equal to objects of X, which is X naught and home um, um, arrows are given by, but I guess I'm out of time. So let me just finish. So the mapping space in X from X to Y is the fiber product X cross over it's one. X cross over X naught, X one cross over homotopy fiber products. It's this homotopy fiber product and uh, home X, Y, home in pi zero of X 
from x to y is just pi zero of maps x y. Right. So we get a Siegel category out of any. Uh, uh, sorry, we get an ordinary category pi zero uh, out of any Siegel category, and of course, a special case is any simplicially enriched category. Any S set enriched category defines a Siegel category. Um, with the mapping spaces given by, by this formula and the composition is just this, the strict composition. And I let you figure out uh, how the simplicial object is constructed. It's just got by defining Xn, uh, at least at the level of objects, Xn is really functors from N into uh, So, so you get a simplicially enriched category out of, uh, sorry, you get a Siegel category out of any simplicially enriched category. Uh, and here's a whole lot of sort of example. Uh, so, okay, so I, I think I should stop there. But uh, basically what I want to say is that I've given you now an infinite set of examples of infinity categories. Anytime you have a pair C comma W, where C is an ordinary category and W is a subcategory of any subcategory you like, uh, which contains all objects, um, you get, by localization, by simplicial localization, a simplicially enriched category, which is one way to think of an infinity one category. You can think of them in weaker with weaker definitions of composition and associativity as either quasi categories or uh, Siegel categories and so on. I haven't told you how to go between the different models, but in fact, all the models are equivalent. Um, and next time, maybe I can say a little bit about that. Uh, and then work with the examples coming from different areas of mathematics to show you how it lets you build bridges between different areas of geometry and physics. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Pranav. Thank you once again. So any questions? Just a logistical point. Um, are these uh, uh, lectures going to be, are the videos going to be available uh, like right now or are they going to be available later? Because I need to look at this lecture once again or a couple of times again before the next lecture. So the earlier videos are already available in uh, ISI Bangalore YouTube channel. Uh, and this one I'll try to upload but tomorrow morning. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So the next lecture is tomorrow only, right? Yeah, yeah, oh, tomorrow it's... will be the last lecture, and uh, yeah, same time. It's on Thursday, right, uh, Anita, or tomorrow? Uh, I think we decided on 8th, uh, you know, 7th. Ah, 8th, I see, I see. Okay, tomorrow okay. is 8th. Yeah, great, great. Yeah. Perfect, yeah, just wanted to make sure. I, I got confused. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so any questions, uh, comments? Yeah, I'm happy to clarify anything. I mean, uh, I sketched many definitions, but if people want more detail or uh, question about how to go between the different models, we can say a bit more. Or happy to do it next time. If people yeah, maybe yeah, it, was honest, yeah, the, yeah. it was honestly very overwhelming. Like. The first part I was some I was familiar with simplicity to wire construction, but later when you moved on to infinity one and infinity n categories, I got very lost, and that's what that's the reason I wanted the lecture with you because I want to look at. Okay, so maybe I can summarize what I said and what is needed. So basically, if you have the way infinity categories often arise in other areas of mathematics, uh, is that you take a category and a subcategory of weak equivalence. Yes. yes. And if you invert the elements of uh, the weak equivalences, you can do it in a kind of brute force way and you get just another category, CW inverse. 
But you can do it in a slightly more careful way. You can look at what you're actually doing when you invert, and you will observe that what you're really doing is constructing a simplicial set of morphisms between any two objects. Yes, 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 yes. yes. And yes. in the first lecture, we saw that a simplicial set, which satisfies the Kahn condition, models the idea of an infinity groupoid, something where you have objects, parts between objects, parts between yes. parts, and so on. Yes, and so, yes, yes. so what we have done is we have started with a category and a subcategory. And through this process of localization, of inverting W, we have produced a new structure, which has objects. But between two, every, every two objects, it has an infinity groupoid, a simplicial set. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Right? So, so the, this, this part I this, followed, yes. Yeah, so this models the idea of an infinity one category, something where you have objects, morphisms, two morphisms, and so on. But everything above level one is invertible up to homo. Yes, yes. Uh, so it's an infinity one category. Now you could say uh, that something deficient in this definition because composition in this simplicially enriched category is strictly associative. If I have three arrows, F, G, and H, and I compose them, yes, it doesn't yes, matter yes. what arrow is strictly associated. Yes. But if you believe in the principle of homotopy theory that we have been using all along, that we should replace equality, equalities by explicit isomorphisms. Exactly, yes. Then we should weaken the, associate, the strict associativity to a weaker associativity. Yes. Now, how do we do that? We, we need to use a de-looping machine. Why? Because de-looping machines essentially tell us Look at the loop space of a topological space. Yes. What is that has a multiplication on loops, which is yes. which is not not associative on the nose, but associative. But it is associative up to homotopy. Up to homotopy, and the principle is that I mean, in some sense, Grothendieck's hypothesis that principle is telling us that we should take this to be the prototype or the archi you know the archetypical example. Of what it means to have a multiplication that is associated up to home, up to homotopy. Yes. So whatever structure you find on a loop space is the structure by by fiat that should encode whatever weak associativity is supposed to mean. Yes. So we look at loop spaces and we ask how can we recognize them, and we found at least two ways. I mean, not we as in uh, Stashev and found one way, and then Segal. Uh, and, and Siegel found a different way, corresponding to each of these ways. We've, by just taking their theorems and uh, replacing, so in a, in, a, in a topological space, base space, you have one base point and loop starting and ending at the same point. Yes. In a category, you have many points, many objects, and you have parts connecting the objects, and you want to compose those parts in a weakly associative way. So you just take their characterization of loop spaces and drop the condition that phi zero be a, a monoid, uh, sorry, be a group. You know, okay. uh, and you allow yes. many objects. You allow uh, instead of one base point, you have many base points. So you drop the condition that x naught consists of one point, and you drop the condition that pi zero be group like. I see. So then you get a notion of a category which has a simplicial set of morphisms or a space of morphisms, and a uh, multiplication that's associated, you know, only weakly associative and. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, so just to clarify. So yeah, last time we did operats, and operats actually encode this idea of associativity up to homotopy. Yeah. Yes. Today I gave a different yes. way, which is Siegel's machine, which also encodes associativity up to homotopy yes. in, a, in a more uh, implicit kind of way. So it is similar in spirit to the definition of weak Kahn complex. In a weak Kahn complex, you don't explicitly say how you multiply morphisms. Yes, yes, yes. The composition of morphisms is implicit in the structure of the simplicial set. So similarly here, if you look at Siegel's de-looping machine, uh, what Siegel's de-looping machine does is it it gives a characterization of loop spaces without ever specifying explicitly how to compose loops. Yes, yes, it yes, just, indeed, indeed, indeed. It gives a simplicial object whose nth space is this fiber product, <coughs> and observes that this this uh, simplicial object has a property, namely that the Siegel maps these maps from x n to the fiber products. Are weak homotopy equivalences. Yes. Yes. So it's Im implicit, yes. and then the, the composition is implicitly defined, sort of by looking at this uh, diagram. You take x two and look at the the two face maps, 
the face map to x1 homotopy fiber product x1 and the, uh, the third face map to x1 and then you get a map not a, a point set map of topological spaces but a map defined in the homotopy category from the left hand side to the x1 right hand side to the right hand side and that is your kind of weakly defined composition yes uh, whatever that and is. the weak and the weak uh, associativity comes from x3 again hmm as before so these are all you no know, this also i followed what i could not actually follow is how we use this to the dwyer kahn special category like i understand the philosophy but i want to look at it a little more carefully to right 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 so basically we, we, just to say in words we take this definition and you drop the condition that uh, pi 0 is uh, you know that x not is group -like. is contractible and pi 0 of x1 is group like just drop those two conditions and you have generalized from looking at loops at a point to having many points and allowing your paths to be non invertible paths right you want a notion of a path an arrow that is not right. invertible so you just drop right. the condition that pi pi not of x1 is good yes, yes. Uh, and that gives you a model and a notion of what an infinity one category is of course the hard thing is i've given you all these different models of infinity one categories a priori they could be very different notions the the deep theorem due to many people but julie bergner contributed a lot to it and jacob lurey and others is that all these give you equivalent homotopy theories they give you the same infinity category of infinity categories ha ha i see which is which is yes 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 it's which is very which is definitely very nice yes hmm. and here uh, so again this small clarification so so you are stating that if we take these two conditions of this contractibility and that pi zero is group like then we can use this model so like the sorry so if we remove these two conditions then the the uh, d category that we find from a pair a category and its sub category we yeah. can so that serves as a model for this second condition without those two yeah in that case i i get an actual simplicity enriched category so the yes. composition is strictly associative so uh, yes. you know it's a special kind of segal category in which the composition is strictly associative i see because every strictly... okay okay yeah and and the infinite and the category of infinity one categories is all segal spaces with these two conditions removed that's one model for what the category of infinity categories is i see i see i see okay okay thank you thank you thank you so much yeah, okay. Yeah. yes okay so are there any more questions yeah i think we should all uh, go back and uh, look at the video to be uh, to be able to ask more questions okay so then uh, let's uh, thank pranav once more thanks pranav for the wonderful talk and uh, we will see, we'll see you tomorrow we'll see you tomorrow thank you so much yes. thank you so yeah. much yeah thank you thank you